Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome. I hope you're all having a wonderful, safe, and happy Independence Day weekend. We are Kirkwood Presbyterian Church in Springfield, Virginia, and we're really happy that you're here with us this morning. We hope you'll feel embraced by the love of Jesus Christ through this congregation. If you're new to Kirkwood, please take a few moments to fill out our new visitor form. You'll find that on our homepage, kirkwoodpres.com, and there's a link over on the right-hand side that says new visitor form. It's pretty easy. While you're there, look under the communications tab at the upper right, and that's where you can find a copy of today's bulletin to, to follow along in worship. But don't worry, if you don't feel like downloading it, we'll be projecting the key text for elements of the worship as we go along. So you should be able to follow along even if you don't have a bulletin. Take a moment at some point to leave a note in the comment section of the Facebook Live feed to greet your fellow worshipers and to let us know that you're out there. It helps us to keep track of how many people are watching our service and to better reach everyone that we need to reach. Today, immediately following worship, there will be a fellowship hour via the Zoom meeting platform. You'll find the information you need to join that Zoom meeting in our weekly email, This Week at Kirkwood, that comes out each Thursday from the office. If you're not already on our email list and you'd like to be, please just drop a line to our wonderful office manager, Anne. She'll be very happy to add you to the list and you'll get future mailings. She's office manager at kirkwoodprez.com. Finally, there's another fellowship opportunity this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Again, that information about how to join the meeting is in the weekly email blast. <clears throat> Please join us if you're able. And now, let us open our hearts and minds and prepare to worship our God. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down for relief, one lay down your head upon my breast. I gave you Jesus as I passed, so weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's fight. Look unto me, your morn shall rise, and all your day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my sword, my sword. And in that light of life, one more Good morning, Kirkwood. At this time, please join me in the call to worship. Jesus says, Come, all that are weary and carrying heavy burdens. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now please join me in the gathering prayer. God of life, in our baptism you called us to belong to something much bigger than ourselves. You called us to belong to each other within the body of Christ, and you called us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom throughout the world. Grant us courage to be faithful witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life, regardless of the cost or consequences. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
come to this time of confession, let us remember that this is our opportunity to rid ourselves of the burden of anything that might come between us and God and prevent us from being able to seek and serve our Lord. So often, like the Apostle Paul, even when we want to do what is good, evil lies close by to snare us. In our inmost selves, we may delight in God's law, yet we are captive to the law of sin that threatens to undo us and keep us apart from God and neighbor. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who intercedes for us. With humble and penitent hearts, let us confess our sins before our God who loves us. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, our judge and redeemer, in your presence we confess our sins, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. Have mercy on us. You alone know how often we have sinned and in how many ways. In vain we have tried to hide from you, for we know we have done wrong. We have chosen to live for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and shirked our obligation to help bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. We have failed to honestly measure our own lives and actions against the standard of the Lord we claim to follow. Hear us now in the silence as we offer up the prayers of our inmost hearts. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Our God is good to all and has compassion for all of creation. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. You are the Lord.
And now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Hey kids, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Today, I'm going to tell you a love story. Okay, I know love stories can be kind of mushy and yucky, but I promise I'll leave out the yucky parts, okay? Today, I'm going to tell you about Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac was the son of Abraham, and Abraham was one of the biggest leaders in the early part of the Bible. He was the one who first began talking to God, and God promised he would be the father of a huge family, and that God would give, him, give them a homeland to live in. And as our story begins, Abraham was getting to be really, really old. And Isaac was already almost 40 years old, and he wasn't married yet. Abraham, he knew that in order for God's promise to be fulfilled, he had to have grandchildren. And with Isaac not married yet, that didn't sound very good. So he wanted to be sure to find a wife for Isaac. And he knew that he didn't want Isaac to marry one of the girls that were in the area where they were then living. He wanted a girl from his old hometown. So he thought, okay, I need to send someone there because I'm too old to go by myself. And he called for one of his most faithful and oldest servants, a man named Eliezer. And he said to Eliezer, go to my homeland and find a wife for Isaac. Well, Eliezer wanted to do the right thing and be faithful to his promise to Abraham. And he wanted to be sure to find the right wife, but he wasn't sure how he was going to find her or how he was going to get her to come back. Still, he collected up everything he would need for the trip and he found some companions and some provisions and they loaded it all up onto 10 camels and they set off. And as he they traveled along toward Abraham's home village. Eliezer prayed to God for help. And finally, he got an idea. He got a plan. When he got there, he went to the city well and he prayed again to God. He said, God, I need you to show me the right girl. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll ask her for a drink of water. And if she gives me a drink of water, then, if she volunteers without me having to even ask her, if she volunteers to get water for all of my thirsty camels, well, then I'll know she's the one that you've got in mind for my master Isaac. Just then, Rebecca came walking up the path toward the well. And guess what? She did everything exactly the way Eliezer prayed. She ran back and forth to the well and she carried water until all of those camels were no longer thirsty and they were happy. And Eliezer gave her some beautiful jewelry as an engagement present. And he asked her to take him, take, take him back to her home. And so he met her father and her brother and the rest of her family. And they learned from him that Abraham had sent him to find a wife for Isaac. That made them all very, very happy. So they were agreeable, but they asked Rebecca, are you okay with this? Would you like to go and marry Isaac? And she said, yes, I'll go. So they left the very next day and they headed for Isaac's home. And as they were getting closer, they saw a man walking toward them across the field. When Rebecca saw him. She said to Eliezer, who is that coming? He says, that's my master Isaac, and she was very excited. And then he got close enough and he saw Rebecca. And it was love at first sight. Okay, I know that was a little yucky, but not too bad, right? They got married right away. And for all of their lives, they loved each other very much. And they became the parents of Jacob, who in turn became one of the forefathers of our Lord Jesus. Let's have a prayer. 
Dear God, we know that you're always there to provide for our needs, and we're very, very thankful. Help us always to trust you for everything that we need in life, and help us always to remember that we can turn to you in prayer and that you'll reach out and help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time of offering, please remember to send your contributions by mail. This is easy if you have pledge envelopes, because they are pre-addressed to the church. Just add your return address in a stamp. Or, you can send your contribution in any envelope and mark Offering in the memo line of the check. Our address is on our website. When Rebecca was asked if she would yield her life to God's purposes, she answered, I will. Each day we have the opportunity to accept that same challenge. Let our offerings symbolize our desire to do God's will. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have filled our lives with countless blessings. As we present these offerings, we also offer our lives in service. Make us your bold and faithful people, willing to go forward in faith wherever you lead us, that we might be a comfort in the world. We pray in the name of Jesus, by the gift of your empowering spirit. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to turn to the final page of your bulletin where you'll find the list of joys and concerns for this congregation. With open hearts, let us now approach the throne of grace, entrusting our praise, our thanksgiving, and our petitions to our God. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, we come before you this day with so much on our minds that it's sometimes difficult to put words around our thoughts. But we trust you. We trust that you know us through and through, our good and bad aspects, our strengths and our weaknesses. We trust that you know our innermost thoughts even when we have no words, and that you love us despite the worst we sometimes display. God, we thank you for the privilege of living in freedom, for the right to worship as we choose and the ability to democratically elect our leaders. We ask that by your spirit, you would prod us consistently to work so that all of your children might enjoy that same privilege, whether here or in far-flung places. Make us your agents of peace. Help us to stand for what we know is right and keep us faithful as we seek to follow your will. God, each of us comes to you from a unique place, a different perspective. Some have hearts that are overflowing with joy and gratitude, while others struggle to keep the faith in a world where it seems that hope is dead. We count on you to meet us wherever we are and to knit us together as your people. Our Savior promised to make us into one body working together for the good of all. Help us to see each other's needs and rise to meet them. And in all we do, Lord, make us worthy to be called followers of your Son. God of life, as always, we thank you for the many joys and special events in our lives. This week, we rejoice with Brianna, who has a birthday, and with Chris and Ginny as they celebrate their anniversary. O oh God, the great physician, we pray that you would grant healing and wholeness to those we know and love and to those we don't know who need it. We pray for Bob and Dick and Joanne and Millie, and we pray for others named only in our hearts and placed before you now in the silence. God of compassion. One of the most difficult challenges we face at this time is that we often cannot be with the people we love. Help us to entrust to your care those we hold dear in our hearts. Be and abide with each person who waits by the phone for news of an aging parent, an ailing relative, or a beloved friend. Help us to feel in your comforting presence the connections we so need to the ones we miss. And Lord, we pray for those who are called to serve in places far from home, for mission workers sharing your good news and doctors and nurses and first responders and others who must self-isolate to protect their families from disease. We pray for the men and women of our armed forces who sacrifice personal security and time with their loved ones in order to keep us safe. Be with each of these and with the families who wait and pray for their safe return. God of wonder, you are with us always, for which we give you thanks and praise. We know you hold all things in your hands, the past, the present, and the future, and that you're in control. But we still face struggles and doubts. We struggle to hear your word for us. We struggle to bear strong witness to the love that sustains us and in which we live. Help us, O oh God, to be strong and resolute. Help us to trust in your grace and power and make us instruments of your love and peace in this troubled world. Make us better sisters and brothers, honoring the image of God in each person we meet and energize us to challenge systems and institutions that marginalize and abuse those whom you would have us love. God of absolute power, we pray for our leaders 
and for leaders around the world. We pray for our president, our vice president, for members of the cabinet and the Congress and the courts of our land. Teach them to seek your counsel and guide them to make well-informed decisions and to use the power invested in them with wisdom and restraint. By your Holy Spirit, inspire them to practice compassion in every act of leadership. Gracious and merciful God, creator of heaven and earth, we join our voices with all the voices of creation in blessing you and giving thanks to you. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Since Pentecost, our Hebrew Bible lessons have been following the story of the patriarch Abraham. Today's lesson picks up when Abraham was an old man. Sarah has already died and Abraham realizes it's time for him to find a wife for his son Isaac. So Abraham charges his most trusted servant to return to his ancestral home, Ur of the Chaldeans, and to bring back a wife for his son from his own kindred. The servant has made the trip, has met the maiden Rebekah, and is now speaking to her father and her brother. Listen now to the word of God as recorded in the 24th chapter of the book of Genesis. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring, and I said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going, I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me so that I may turn either to the right hand or the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent, away the, they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, 
May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Be'er Lahayroi and was settled in the Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Almighty God, speak to us this day. By your Holy Spirit, move among us, that the words we speak here and the words we hear may be your word, and that what we choose to do with them may be your will. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our story opens on Abraham. He's now an old man. His beloved wife, Sarah, died at the age of 127 in Canaan at Hebron, about 15 miles south of Jerusalem. And losing Sarah must have been something of a wake-up call for Abraham because suddenly it dawned on him that his only son, Isaac, was already 37 years old, maybe even older, and still unmarried. Abraham knew he wanted grandchildren. That was part of God's promise, after all, and he knew he wanted them to be descended from his own people. He didn't want Isaac to marry one of the local Canaanite girls. But how would he manage that? Since leaving his ancestral home in Mesopotamia, 62 years had passed, and Abraham had put quite a few miles under his belt. And now, Frankly, he was too old to consider going back there, and he did not want Isaac to go there at all. So he called for his most senior servant. We aren't told his name, but I'm going to follow the lead of many scholars and assume it was the same person Abraham was prepared to name as his heir way back in chapter 15 of Genesis when he heard God calling and he pushed back, Lord, what can you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Okay, so Eliezer it is. Eliezer had been with Abraham a long time, a very long time, and if anyone could be entrusted with the all-important task of finding a bride for Isaac, it was him. So Abraham gave him explicit marching orders. And from the way he gave them, I'm thinking he might not have been sure he would live long enough to see them fulfilled. He said, Eliezer, I need you to find a wife for Isaac, but you must swear before God that you will not allow him to marry a Canaanite girl. You must go to my country and kindred and find the right woman there. As you might imagine, Eliezer had some concerns. Wouldn't it be smarter and easier, he asked, if he just took Isaac with him and let him pick his own bride? No way. Abraham was adamant, no way. Isaac needed to remain in Canaan, in the land that God promised to them. But Abraham was also faithful. He promised Eliezer that God would send an angel along with him to ensure the success of the mission. And Abraham was reasonable. He promised that if Eliezer tried and failed, as long as he gave it a good try, his obligation would be satisfied. But he had to promise not to take 
Isaac there. So Eliezer swore an oath to act as Abraham's agent, to find a suitable wife for Isaac, to make the necessary arrangements with her family, and finally to persuade her to return with him to Canaan. And make no mistake, this was not an easy trip. In fact, it was about 640 miles. And now, just for perspective, that's about how far it is from here to Chicago or to, say, Jacksonville, Florida, or Quebec City in Canada. Except, instead of spending an hour or so on a plane or a day in an air-conditioned car, Eliezer would be spending a month or more each way on a camel. To prepare for the journey, he assembled a few men to travel with him and provisions for the road, and a nice selection of gifts to take along with them. And he packed it all on 10 camels and he traveled to the city of Nahor. And by the time they arrived, he had a very detailed plan in place, a plan that began with prayer. Now I find this interesting. We're accustomed to thinking of Abraham as a man of great faith, despite all the incidents documenting foibles that were in his life, you know, places where he didn't exactly have all that much faith. But we know very little about the people around him. And I think this passage speaks very eloquently of the kind of man Abraham was when the cameras were off, if you will. It provides some evidence, some hard evidence, that the faith he claimed was really something that was taught and practiced within his own community. Because this servant, a man who had started life as a slave in Abraham's tent, who had been with him for years, seen him in good times and bad times, and traveled all over the map with him, was circumcised along with his master and every other male in the camp so many years ago, this Eliezer displayed a level of faith that I find to be nearly mind-boggling. As he approached the well at Nahor that day, Eliezer knew he would need all the help he could get from God if his mission was going to be a success. How would he find Abraham's people among all the others there? How would he know which woman was the right woman? And how would he approach her? What would he say? So he prayed. First, a rather all-encompassing prayer. God, give me success this day. A prayer that his plan would produce some desired result. And then he began to lay out the details of the plan. God, I'm going to stand near the well where the spring comes up and the daughters of the town come out to draw their water. And I'm going to speak to one of them. I'm going to ask her for a drink. And God, if she gives me the drink I ask for, and then if she goes the extra mile and offers also to bring water to my 10 thirsty camels, well, God, then I'll know she's the one you have chosen for Isaac. And furthermore, I'll know for certain that you love my master, Abraham, with a love that is unwavering and steadfast. And before he could even tack on an amen to his prayer, he saw Rebecca approaching the well. She was beautiful. And he immediately thought, this is the one. So when she had descended down to the well and was coming back up with her jar full of water, Eliezer asked her for a drink. And from this point, the narrative plays out pretty much as if everyone was actually reading from the prayer script that Eliezer had spoken only to God in his mind. And you heard it a few moments ago when I read the scripture lesson. At this point, I need to interject just a little bit about camels. We call them the ships of the desert because they're big and they're strong. They carry a lot of stuff, about 900 pounds each they can carry. And they're able to go for a long, long time, over two weeks between water stops. 
That's the good thing. The bad part, camels aren't very nice. Quite frankly, they're nasty tempered and they spit and they bite. And when they finally do reach their destination, they're really thirsty. So here's the real challenge. Even assuming she was exceptionally strong and fit, which is a reasonable assumption, Rebecca could maybe have carried five gallons of water on each trip to the well. That's 42 pounds of water, not counting the weight of the pottery jar that was holding it, which was probably close to 20 pounds. A thirsty camel can drink over 30 gallons of water in less than 15 minutes. And Eliezer had 10 camels. You can do the math. For Rebecca's sake, let's hope they weren't that thirsty. In any event, think about it. Imagine the incredible sense of hospitality instilled in a young woman, probably still in her teens, that she would volunteer to make how many? 10, 20, 30 extra trips to the well to quench the thirst of 10 not very nice beasts that belonged to a total stranger? Imagine it. Our story predictably has a happy ending. Eliezer, convinced that Rebecca was the bride God intended for Isaac, met with her family and he gained their blessing and he gained her agreement. And together they returned to Canaan where it was pretty much love at first sight. Isaac and Rebecca were married and Abraham actually lived to see the whole thing come to pass. In fact, he lived long enough to see the birth of his twin grandsons, Esau and Jacob, though that's a story for another day. I suppose it's possible there might be a bit of hyperbole in our story. Did Rebecca really carry 300 or so gallons of water up from the well? Did anyone even do the math of the camels times the thirst divided by the jar size times however long each trip to the well would take? Or maybe had the camels just refilled that morning? Who knows? And really, does it even matter? The point is this. In faith and in humility, Eliezer prayed to God asking for a sign that he was on the right track. A sign that was specific enough that it couldn't be mere coincidence. And even before he finished his prayer, Rebecca was walking up the path and God was giving him an answer. God knew the need and knew Eliezer's desire to do the right thing. And God intended to be faithful to the covenant he'd made so long ago with Abraham. So God participated, certainly by responding to the prayer, but probably also in the prayer itself. I'm certain you, like I, have known, have known people, heard examples of people who have formed a deep and abiding relationship with God through their prayer lives. These are folks who trust that they can go to God in times of anything, any deep need. And even before they have words to frame their thoughts, God is speaking into the silence, offering a light at the end of the tunnel, a fresh idea, a sign of hope, perhaps even a familiar verse of scripture. This is actually something that we are promised. Writing to the Romans, the Apostle Paul attributed this kind of a relationship to the action of the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Sighs too deep for words. What a wonderful thought. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so, Eliezer, a man of great faith, prayed. And even as he was praying, God was preparing Rebekah 
to be the answer to that prayer. And even though he expected God to help him, even though he prayed in faith, and even after Rebecca had passed the ridiculously difficult challenge Eliezer had set before her, a challenge she didn't even know of, there was a moment in which he still needed to just sit and think about the situation one more time. As Rebecca was running back and forth to the well, scripture says he gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Dr. Gareth Eisnogel attributes this to the sense of reservation that's inherent in any healthy prayer life. He says, we do not have the last word. If we pray according to scripture and according to Eliezer and even in the life of Jesus, we always give God the option that God may want to do something differently than we pray. Even Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Eliezer prayed in faith, and the course of history hinged on his prayer. Beyond that, he put his faith and his prayer into action. Rebecca went to the well that day having no idea God was preparing her to be the answer to his prayer. May we, like Eliezer, be bold in our prayers, confident in God's steadfast love, and humble, ready to accept whatever answer we may receive. And may we, like Rebecca, remain alert to sense and respond to the prodding of the Holy Spirit whenever it may come. For at any moment, God may be preparing any one of us to be the answer to someone's heartfelt and faithful prayer. And in all, may God's will be done. Amen. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my
Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. to seek and serve the Lord. Be brave and strong of heart, diligent in your prayers, and confident that the Lord God will provide all that you need. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be and abide with you this day, in the week to come, and forevermore. Let the people of God say together, Amen.